I'm in Reen Farm, which is an extraordinary place that was happened upon by John and Christine Kelly in a series of bizarre coincidences and chance, or maybe not, that led them here over time. And it is the site of not just great physical beauty, but also of great past horror. And I've said before when here that you are filled with um, a sense of absence. I'm going to amend that because just walking through this magnificent sky garden and seeming tombs, this great work of art that he's made out of his whole home, that while there is that felt and palpable absence, there also is concomitantly a great sense of presence. And maybe John and Christine have made that presence appear. And I'm not one for the karmic ragtag and bobtail, as I say. Um, maybe there are no ghosts knocking at John's brain or on the farmhouse door and saying, we were here and this is where we died in utter degradation and horror. And frankly, I'm reminded as this work continues and seems to consume this family, um, quite rightly, I've been to many of the Holocaust Memorial Museums throughout the world. And gradually more and more, again, by a seeming weird chain of coincidence and chance, the artworks that John has uh, made over the course of years, s without seeming reference to each other, there's a, there's a mini version of the modern Tate Museum in London there. And this ancient, almost, um, these dolmens, these, these sort of Tara in miniature that he created for his birthday. I'm not sure that's what happened, but they seem to be uniting now in some sort of bizarre common purpose in memory of the small houses that dotted this farm, of the hundreds of people who died here. And it seems to me that I'm getting the same sensation as when I visit those more studied pieces of art that are the memorials to the Holocaust. And quite rightly, that word is overused and quite rightly, Jews feel a sense of ownership of that great horror and that word which should only describe their particular suffering, the Shoah. This wasn't the Irish Shoah. It wasn't some planned, mad, scientific, racist thing. This was a combination of bureaucratic inertia, confusion, agricultural failure, a, a social system that just simply couldn't deal in the course of three or four years with the decimation of the Irish population, a reduction by 50%, which in anybody's language must be deemed a Holocaust, just sweeping through a land and taking the people, their language, and all that vast culture away from them. And it was noted by the people around them. It wasn't ignored by anyone, which is part of the oddness of this terror. And one of the people who couldn't turn away was one of the worthies of the town, one of the few middle class of the town, a justice of the peace. And he seems to me to be a very modern man. It's a bit embarrassing that it's me talking about this, but I pointed out to the West Cork History Festival people that this man, this good man, N.M. Cummings, this Justice of the Peace, had written his letter to the London Times on Christmas Eve, 1846. And all the language of this letter and the people to whom he addresses, and the sort of moral arm lock he puts on them is very reminiscent to me of that time in 1984 when we were alerted to the great African famines, which lasted more or less the same period of time and which wasn't as devastating as what happened to the Irish in terms of numbers or indeed in terms of 
uh, the cultural meaning. Cummings wrote this on Christmas Eve. What Band-Aid tried to do was to use the notion of Christmas, where we become expansive, where we exchange gifts, where we open up to others, where we do begin to notice the homeless, or where we do begin to invite people into our homes, where families make up and break up again, where old enmities should be put to rest, even if they're revived again a week later. And he's using that time, and he's appealing to the leaders of that country and saying, I'm writing to you directly. There's no turning away now from the civil service reports. I'm telling you boldly, and I am substantial. I am a minister of the court. And I'm telling you this is what's happening. And I can only tell you in as bold, as vulgar, as awful a way I can. And he's asking their forgiveness, but he's also saying to him, if you can do this, this will surpass everything achieved in a life of achievement. And we have a young queen, and she is a woman, and she must not and will not turn away. I've subsequently learned that within two weeks of this letter being printed in the Times, and this is another significant factor, like in 1984, there was now a global medium. The Times had become a significant channel of communication with everybody at this stage. Newspapers were a mass medium for the first time almost. So this man Cummings, out of Skibbereen County Cork, knew exactly what he was doing. And two weeks after this letter, at this time of the year, to these people, the Queen started the British Relief Association with £20,000, which was effective. In one of the reports I was reading just this morning, um, a lot of the relief for a certain period came through that organisation. Of course, we subsequently know what happened and it's resonated palpably, palpably down all these years, so that the Irish in principle in general respond almost like, again, not particularly one of those things I believe in, a folk memory kicks in. But being here on this sacred and hallowed ground where John and Christine are trying to find the names of the people here, remember them, etch them in stone, place them in the ground upon which they lie. Then as I say, they are absent. They were absent within their own lifetimes, but they're coming back. They are not forgotten. Their presence becomes more and more real. That is not only something wholly desirable, it is something classically historical. And I hope people aren't offended by this, but it is a great work of art because it is what art does. It enables humanity because humans at their ultimate are creatives. They're using this. If only this appeal to this had worked in 1846. The Think and Thank Garden, Genesis, begins in 2009 after I attended a lecture by Catherine Marshall, the former head of collections at the Irish Museum of Modern Art. It was held at the West Cork Art Centre and titled Visualising the Unspeakable, an Unresolved Dilemma for Irish Artists. Marshall addressed the fact that there was a scarcity of fine art relating to on to Moore and put forward the experience of R.G. Kelly, an Irish artist who exhibited a painting of an eviction scene at the British Institution in 1853, Strickland, in his Dictionary of Irish Artists, records that the painting, an ejectment in Ireland, or a tear and prayer for Erin, was much criticised as a political picture which the artist never intended, and was actually discussed in the House of Commons. Kelly got the message and appears to have avoided such subjects for the remainder of his career. The problem was not the depiction of poverty, but rather the politicisation of that poverty in a colonised country. At the same time that Irish artists were being cancelled in Black 47, the crucifixion attributed to the Master of Arkan altarpiece dated 1490-95 to was hung in the National Gallery in London after being presented by Edward Shippardston. This painting is a gruesome depiction of the execution of three emaciated men 
by the cruelest of torture techniques and shown to the public at the same time Irish artists could not depict the horrific scenes that were happening across the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. As a contemporary Irish artist, my response to this dilemma is the Think and Thank Garden I created at our home on Reen Farm, South Reen. It is a contemporary artwork including installations of made and found objects, earthworks and text etched into Irish limestone which records a West Cork history that begins with a letter by Nicholas Marshall Cummins published in the Times on 24th of December 1846. It was an open letter addressed to the Duke of Wellington and was Cummins' eyewitness account of what was happening on the South Rheem Peninsula following a blight that caused an airborne fungal disease, Phytophora infestans, a disease that destroyed the potato crop. It is estimated a million died and two million left these shores. In 2020, we placed the N.M. Cummins letter in a glass house representing the structure of the contemporary British art gallery, Tate Modern. My reason for this is because as on Goethe Moore was decimating the population of Ireland, Cummins' letter painted the picture in words the artist could not. This is the text of N.M. Cummins' letter published in the Times on Christmas Eve in 1846 and it's addressed to that most eminent of Irish Englishmen, the Duke of Wellington. To His Grace, Field Marshal the Duke of Wellington, My Lord Duke, without apology or preface, I presume so far to trespass on Your Grace as to state to you and by the use of your illustrious name to present to the British public the following statement of what I myself have seen within the last three days. Having for many years been connected with the western portion of the county of Cork and possessing some small property there, I thought it right personally to investigate the truth of the several lamentable accounts which had reached me of the appalling state of misery to which that part of the country was reduced. I accordingly went on the 15th inst to Skibbereen, and to give the instance of one townload, townland which I visited, as an example of the state of the entire coast district, I shall state simply what I there saw. It is situated on the eastern side of Castlehaven Harbour and is named South Ream in the parish of Myroth. Being aware that I should have to witness scenes of frightful hunger, I provided myself with as much bread as five men could carry, and on reaching the spot, I was surprised to find the wretched hamlet apparently deserted. I entered some of the hovels to ascertain the cause, and the scenes that presented themselves were such no tongue or pen can convey the slightest idea of. In the first six famished and scarcely skeletons, to all appearance dead, were huddled in a corner on some filthy straw, their sole covering what seemed a ragged horse cloth naked above the knees. I approached in horror, and found by a low moaning they were alive, they were in fever, Four children, a woman, and what, what had once been a man. It is impossible to go through the details. Suffice to say that in a few minutes I was surrounded by at least two hundred of such phantoms, such frightful spectres as no words can describe. By far the greater number were delirious, either from famine or fever. Their demonic yells are still yelling in my ears, and their horrible images are fixed upon my brain. My heart sickens at the recital, but I must go on. In another case, decency would forbid what follows, but it must be told. My clothes were nearly torn off in my endeavours to escape from the throng of pestilence around, when my neckcloth was seized from behind by a grip which compelled me to turn. I found myself grasped by a woman with an infant just born in her arms and the remains of a filthy sack across her loins, the sole covering of herself and babe. The same morning the police, opening a house on the adjoining lands which was observed shut for many days, and two frozen corpses were found lying upon the mud floor, half devoured by the rats. A mother, herself in fever, was seen the same day to drag out the corpse of her child, a girl of about eleven, perfectly naked, and leave it half covered with stones. In another house, within five hundred yards, of the cavalry station at Skibbereen, the dispensary doctor found seven wretches lying unable to move under the same cloak. One had been dead for many hours, but the others were unable to move themselves 
or the corpse. To what purpose should I multiply such cases? If these be not sufficient, neither would they hear who has the power to send relief and do not, even though one came from the dead. Let them, however, believe and tremble that they shall one day hear the judge of all the earth pronounce their tremendous doom with the addition, I was hungered, and ye gave me no meat, thirsty, and you gave me no drink, naked, and ye clothed me not. But I forget to whom this is addressed. My Lord, you are an old and justly honoured man. It is yet in your power to add other honour to your age, to fix another star, and that the brightest in your galaxy of glory. You have access to our young and gracious Queen. Lay these things before her. She is a woman. She will not allow decency to be outraged. She has at her command the means of at least mitigating the suffering of the wretched survivors in this tragedy. They will soon be few indeed in the district I speak of if help be longer withheld. Once more, my Lord Duke, in the name of starving thousands, I implore you, break the frigid and flimsy chain of official etiquette and save the land of your birth, the kindred of the gallant Irish blood which you have so often seen lavished to support the honour of the British name, and let there be inscribed upon your tomb, Servata Hibernia. I have the honour to be, my Lord Duke, your Grace's obedient, humble servant, N. M. Cummins, J. P. and Mount Cork, December 17th, 1846. Just as Cummins was penning his harrowing descriptive letter on 17th of December 1846, the Liverpool stipendiary magistrate Edward Rushton claimed that 15,000 Irish starving paupers had landed in Liverpool that same month. They had travelled on the steamers from Cork, Dublin and Sligo. In the Irish language, an Goethe Moor means the Great Hunger, which is the more accurate description of what is often called the Great Irish Famine. To show that food was available, but not necessarily accessible, I quote John Besnard, the General Waymaster in Cork, who at that time gave testimony to the Select Committee on Immigrant Ships, where he stated, The fare from Cork to Liverpool was 10 shillings, and he had witnessed a steamer carrying 1,100 deck passengers and 300 pigs below deck. The fare for the pigs was half that for a passenger, but the pigs, he claimed, were better looked after because they were of value to someone. Another example is written by Edward Cardwell, a Liverpool MP, who read this report to the House of Commons. There were accounts of people crowding between the cattle for the sake of the warmth, amidst a floating mass of salt water and animal excrement. In other words, these poor people came over here subject to every conceivable horror and misery in the passage. The House of Commons was familiar with the case of the Londonderry steamer, and it would be well if it were, but this report spoke of the dead bodies frequently brought on shore and of women brought to bed on the passage. Police constables stated they seen persons frozen to the deck. Besnard also stated, I've gone to Liverpool expressly to wait the arrival of Irish steamers, and no language at my command can describe the scenes I witnessed there. The people were positively prostrated and scarcely able to walk after they got out of the steamers, and then they were seized hold by those unprincipled runners so well known in Liverpool. In fact, I consider the manner in which these passengers are carried from Irish to English ports is disgraceful, dangerous and inhuman. Having survived starvation in Ireland, death was prevalent on the sea crossings to Liverpool, as reported on the Londonderry steamer tragedy by the Times in December 1848. The scene on entering the steerage of the steamer was as awful spectacle as could be witnessed. 72 dead bodies of men, women and children laid piled indiscriminately over each other, four deep, all presenting the ghastly appearance of persons who had died in the agonies of suffocation very many of them covered with blood which had gushed from the mouth or nose or had flowed from the wounds inflicted by the trampling of nail-studded brogues and by the frantic violence of those who struggled for escape. 
for it was but too evident that in that struggle the poor creatures had torn the clothes from each other's backs and even the flesh from each other's limbs. Having safely arrived in Liverpool, they faced further hardship, including immediate deportation back to Ireland, as described by Rushton, the stipendiary magistrate, who on the 21st of April 1849 wrote to Her Majesty's Secretary of State for the Home Department with the following. I saw from day to day that the poor Irish population forced upon us in a state of wretchedness which cannot be described would within 12 hours after they landed be found among one of three classes, the paupers, vagrants or thieves. Few became claimants for parochial relief for in that case they soon discovered they might be at once sent back to Ireland. Many of these forlorn creatures became beggars, many of them thieves. The truth is that jails such as the jail of the borough of Liverpool afforded the wretched and unfortunate Irish better food, shelter and raiment and more cleanliness than it is to be feared many of them experienced elsewhere. And hence it constantly happens that Irish vagrants who have been offered them the choice of being sent to Ireland or to jail in a great majority of cases desire to go to prison. The fact being that the English jails are excellent winter quarters for starving Irish paupers. And in consequence, the jail of Liverpool, which ought never to contain more than 500 prisoners, has now 1,100 within its walls. The cost of all this to the people of Liverpool, both in the augmentation of parochial and of legal charges, is absolutely enormous. So why did N.M. Cummins address his open letter to the Duke of Wellington? The Duke was born Arthur Wellesley at 24 Upper Merion Street, Dublin. When Wellesley became the Duke of Wellington, he became the most prominent military man of the age. His victory at Waterloo not only ended the era of Napoleon, but made Britain the most powerful and influential nation in Europe, indeed in the world. He later served as Prime Minister and leader of the Conservative Party. In 1842, Wellington was named Commander-in-Chief of the British Army, a position he kept until his death in 1853. Wellington was close to the Queen and often carried out instructions on her behalf. He was godfather to one of Victoria's children. The Duke was also very aware of the effects of famine, for when Wellington's army entered Madrid on 12th of August 1812 to the cheers of the population, the French had lost half the territory that they had gained in Spain since 1808 in eight months. There Wellington was met by Francisco de Goya, the court painter who painted Wellington's portrait that now hangs in the National Gallery in London. At the same time, Goya was creating images of famine on etched metal plates that became the series Disasters of War, only editioned as etchings after his death. The etching, plates 48 to 64, detail the effects of the famine which ravaged Madrid from August 1811 until after Wellington's armies liberated the city in August 1812. Starvation killed 20,000 people in the city that year. In these plates, Goya's focus is directed away from the generalised scenes of slaughter of anonymous unaligned people in unnamed regions of Spain. He turns towards a specific horror unfolding in Madrid. Goya does not focus on the reasons for the shortage, nor does he apportion blame to any one party. Instead, he is concerned only with its effects on the population. Goya's focus is on the darkened masses of dead and barely alive bodies, men carrying corpses of women and bereaved children mourning for lost parents. Plate 50. Madre Infeliz. Unhappy Mother. Maybe the most poignant of the group, the small girl sobbing and the corpse of her mother represents a darkness that seems to be the very essence of loss and orphanhood. This group of plates was probably completed by early 1814. Back on South Rhine in July 2021, we placed another etched limestone with an extract from Peter Foyne's book, The Great Famine in Skibbereen. In chapter 3, the winter of 1846 to 1847, where we are informed. In 1847, McCarthy Downing recalled to Monsignor O'Rourke of Maynooth, the first cause of death from starvation occurred at South Reen, five miles from the town of Skibbereen. The case having been reported to me as a member of the Relief Committee, I procured the attendance of Dr. Doré 
and proceeded to the house where the body lay. The scene which presented itself will never be forgotten by me. The body was resting on a basket which had been turned up on an old chair and the legs on the ground. All was wretchedness around. The wife, emaciated, was unable to move and four children, more like spectres than living beings, were lying near the fireplace in which apparently there had not been a fire for some time. The doctor opened the stomach and, repugnant as it was to my feelings, at his solicitation viewed its contents, which consisted of a few pieces of raw cabbage undigested. Another extract from Foyne's book, also etched in Irish limestone, is from Chapter 4, Temporary Relief and the Final Solution, where he recalls Jeremiah O'Callaghan's report of a visit he made to the villages of Reenbeg and South Reen in Myros in late April 1847 shows the effects of the preceding months on one community. A wretched woman holding a little girl who appeared to be in the last stages of famine consumption told him, My husband and four children died of hunger. My eldest girl, 14 years old, died in the Skibbereen workhouse, and I brought her corpse on my back and buried her in Myros churchyard. I asked her to give me some idea of the number of deaths that took place in the neighbourhood in the last three months. She said she did not well know, but she recollected Michael Walsh, her own husband, and four children, James Maloney, his wife, and six children, Jerry Hulan and four in family, James Hooley and four in family, and many others whom she could not then name. There, said she, pointing to an old house, is the place where the Maloney's all died. I entered and there saw the floor strewn with the tattered garments of the late inhabitants. A few torn old hats and other fragments of furniture were all that remained to show that it was once the habitation of the wretched mortals. I quitted this slaughterhouse with feelings I cannot well describe and immediately I was at the door I was met by a gaunt female who exhibited the living remains of her son. The village of South Reen, or more properly speaking, the village of the dead, presented, if possible to our view, signs of greater misery. It consists of 19 houses, nine of which sent the entire inhabitants to another and, I trust, a better world. In January 1847, the Cork Examiner prints a letter by Dr Crowley that reads, Dr Donovan and I are just this moment after returning from the village of South Ring, where we had to bury a body ourselves that was 11 days dead. And where do you think? In the kitchen garden. We had to dig the ground or rather the hole ourselves. No one would come near us. The smell was intolerable. We are half dead from the work lately imposed on us. It is now as I write 11 o'clock and I have not yet dined. After on Goethe Moor, the only physical remnant of the village is a famine pot that we found in the garden on purchasing the property in 2003. We only confirmed its identity in January 2020 from the Phoenix symbol where we learnt it was donated by the Quakers. It is now in the glass tape modern on Reen Farm. I'm reading a letter from Sister Beatrice Sullivan and she is a nun from um, Our Lady of Lourdes Convent in St Augustine, Florida and it's dated the 21st of August 2020 and it's regarding the famine pot. In regards to the famine pot, it's quite possible it was used for soup during the famine. Then it was left resting peacefully. Grandfather Sullivan came to Reen shortly after the famine. He was instructed by the landlord Beecher to clear the property of all building stones, houses, etc. At some point, the pot was installed in the dairy in the left-hand side corner. It was used to boil water for porridge, cornmeal, for the pigs, piglets and other animals. Two or three times a year a pig was killed for family use. That was quite an experience for those involved. When the carcass was ready it was put into that pot and hot water for staving made all nice and clean ready for cutting into parts for salting. The pot was moved to the garden to make space for the milking machine. It certainly was a useful work of art in my day. I'm so happy to see it in a special place of honour. 
A big thank you to you and John and Christina for your time and interest in bringing history to light.